Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Good morning once again, everyone. <laughs> I feel like I did this already, but here we are. Uh, and on this day after Christmas and the last Sunday of the year, I thought it will be fitting for us to continue to linger on the theme of Christmas and the proclamation of Christmas. And to do so, uh, we, we will be uh, looking at the text that comes right after the passage that we read uh, and looked at yesterday. So yesterday we looked at Luke chapter 2 verses 1 to 20 about the birth of Jesus and the proclamation of the good news. Today we read from verses 21 to 40. But before we do that, let me um, just briefly tell you the, the structure or, or the outline of that those verses because there's a lot happening there. So in the first part of the passage, we see Mary and Joseph, now parents of a young baby Jesus, going through some of the rituals that are required by the law for a newborn baby. And then we hear about someone by the name of Simeon and his encounter with Jesus. And then uh, very briefly, we hear about another person whose name is Anna. And again, her encounter with baby Jesus, who she has been waiting for such a long time. So let's read our text together, and I've asked Rebecca to lead us. Please follow along with me as we read from Luke 2, verses 21 to 40. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. So 
So this morning in this passage, I think we learn um, three things, at least three things about Jesus. First, Jesus identifies with his people. Jesus identifies with the people he came to save. And second, he consoles his people. Jesus comforts his people. And third, Jesus redeems his people. So Jesus identifies with his people. Jesus consoles his people and Jesus redeems his people. So first, let's see how Jesus identified with his people. In recording what happened or what took place after the birth of Jesus, Matthew, as we know, um, as he writes his gospel, uh, led by the Holy Spirit, of course, he decided to add the famous story of Magi and how they came to uh, visit baby Jesus and worship him. Luke, on the other hand, again, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, decided to omit that story and instead add these uh, verses that we just read. So for Luke, it is important uh, for his audience and for us to know that after Jesus was born, on the eighth day, he was circumcised according to the law. And um, when he was a month Old, he was brought to the temple to be presented to the Lord, again, as required by the law. And on one hand, there's nothing special about this. Any and all Jewish boys, when they are born, they were required to be circumcised on the eighth day. And if the boy was first born, then he was required to be brought to the temple and uh, presented or dedicated to God at that time. So let me share with you a few different Old Testament verses that speak about this. In Genesis 17, this is God speaking to Abraham. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. That's why Jesus, as a baby, was circumcised on the eighth day. And then in Exodus 13, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to, to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. Do you remember why God gave this command uh, that, that Israelites are to consecrate to him every firstborn male? When God brought upon Egypt the, the last plague, the tenth plague of uh, smiting all the firstborn in Egypt, the firstborn of Israelites, those who painted their doorposts with the lamb, with the blood of the Passover lamb, God spared those firstborns. And thus, now they belonged to God. The, the spared firstborns now belonged to God. And that com comment uh, of God later develops into this law we see in Numbers 18, where it says, You must redeem every firstborn son and every firstborn male of unclean animals. When they are a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price. So when you have a baby boy, uh, of course, uh, he was to be circumcised on the eighth day. And when, when he becomes a month old, uh, because he belongs to God, uh, he was to be redeemed at a, at a certain cost that you would tribute uh, to the temple. So Jesus, as a baby, was going through all this. He was circumcised. He was brought to the temple for redemption. 
And as I said, this is what all Jewish people were required to do. But if we think about it, Jesus is not just an ordinary baby. Right? He is God himself. And circumcision, as we read, is a symbol of the covenant between God and his people. And Jesus is God. So why does he need to be circumcised? And also, isn't it almost absurd to say Jesus needed to be redeemed uh, and presented to God when he himself is God? Yet, Luke is not just mentioning these things in passing, but he is really wanting to make sure that we see what's happening. According to the law, Jesus was circumcised. According to the law, he was redeemed when he was a month old. And then, to really make it sure, at the end of the passage, he says, this is verse 39, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. So, okay, we can see that Jesus kept everything required by the law. But again, why? Why did it put himself under the obligations of the law when he actually is the Lord of the law? Because he needed to identify with the people he came to save. Galatians, Paul, uh, Galatians, Galatians, in Galatians 4, Paul says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. So he who had no sin, God himself was born under the obligations of the law so that he can redeem and rescue those living under the law without ability to obey the law. The writer of the Hebrews put it this way, Hebrews 2 verses 17, for this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of his people. Jesus came to identify with his people. And the second thing that we learn about Jesus in this passage is that he consoles his people. And here comes a man named Simeon. We don't know much about him other than what's written here in this passage, uh, where he says, where Luke says, he was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. This phrase that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel means he was waiting for the Messiah. Ever since prophet Isaiah said, Messiah will come to comfort his people, Israel has been waiting for the consolation of their Messiah. Again, we don't know much about Simeon and what kind of life he lived, but he was desperately needing God's comfort, and he was desperately waiting for the consolation to come. And Luke tells us that God had already uh, come to him and promised him, you will not die before you have seen the consolation of Messiah. You will not die before you see the Messiah yourself. And what a privilege is that? What a privilege to receive a promise that he will not die before he has seen the Lord himself. But I believe it must also have been an agony for him, in a sense, to wait. He had the promise, but he had to wait and wait and wait. 
And finally, the day has come. The Holy Spirit, uh, Luke explains that he was full of Holy Spirit, right? So Holy Spirit on that day prompted him to go to the temple. And he sees this young couple entering into the temple. There was nothing special about them. They looked very poor. But the Holy Spirit was letting Simeon know, this is he. I don't know what he was expecting to see, uh, whether he was expecting to, to, to see a powerful king to show up as the Messiah that he has been waiting. Or maybe he was waiting for some kind of hero to come with thousands of followers to bring peace and consolation to Israel. But instead, when the Holy Spirit convicted in him that this was he, he saw a baby. And we're not told how it happened, but before we know, Simeon is holding the baby in his arms. And we hope he didn't just snatch the baby from Mary's hands. So I think we should use some imagination here. Because the Bible doesn't tell us. As Joseph and Mary entered the temple, still uncertain about all this. About what it means for them to be parents of the Messiah. Parents of God himself. And I think they were tired. Do you think because this baby was God, he didn't cry at night? I think he did. I think Mary was experiencing all that any mother would experience. But also, she was experiencing that no other mother has ever experienced in the human history, being a mother of God. It must have been confusing, uncertain, and undescribable. And as they enter into the temple to dedicate Jesus to the Lord, an old man comes near, led by the Holy Spirit, staring at the baby like a crazy person because he was the Messiah he was waiting for for who knows how long. And then he says to Mary two words. I know. Well, that's not in the Bible. That's my imagination. I know. And I believe the same Holy Spirit that led Simeon to Mary must have been letting Mary know too that this man is from God. And he asks, can I hold the baby? And Mary says, yes. And Joseph, like any typical father, has no idea what's happening. Again, that's not in the Bible. And now holding the baby in his arms holding the Messiah in his arms, holding God in his arms. We can't, we can't hardly imagine the joy that Simeon was experiencing, a joy that so utterly filled and completed his life that he says, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to die. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. I think this is one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible. A prayer that perhaps you and I want to pray at the end of our life. Lord, I can die a happy man because I have seen your salvation. And the word translated here as the Lord is, is not kurios, uh, the word that we looked at yesterday. It's not the kurios, the, the uh, typical word for the Lord. Instead, Simeon is using a word that's only used about 10 times in the New Testament 
referring to God. And if you look up that word, it says an absolute ruler. It's a word that is used to refer to a slave owner who has complete and absolute ownership and control over one's life in life and death. So he is saying, Lord, my absolute master, absolute ruler of history, you may dismiss your servant in peace because living and dying don't matter anymore because I have sinned your salvation. And you can tell that he knew God's promise well. Because he knew that this Messiah has not only come to save him or only Israel, but all nations. He understood that the consolation of Israel was not only for Israel, but for all people. And the glory of Israel is to be a light for the revelation to the Gentiles, you and me. But then Holy Spirit also gave him some very difficult words to be shared with Mary. Again, um, in our text it says, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. This reminds us of what Jesus spoke or what Jesus will be speaking uh, about himself in Matthew 10. He says, do not suppose that I came to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, he says, which speaks about the cost of peace that he brings, the cost of his own blood for the forgiveness of our sins and the healing of the world. Yesterday, we heard about the sign of the manger, a sign of the utter rejection Jesus experienced or he will experience from his people. And again, today, uh, Simeon says, in the same way, he will be a sign that will be spoken against. And then to Mary, he says, and a sword will pierce your soul. Mary, the most wonderful, most gracious event in human history that will take place at Calvary. Mary, your heart will break. Your soul will be pierced as you see your son die on the cross. And that leads us to our last point. Jesus came to redeem his people. In our text, there is another person by the name of Anna. She was very old, Luke says, and she was a widow for about at least 60 years. And she comes from a tribe that has no power and she practically lives in the temple, worshiping, fasting, praying every day. And what was she praying for? All her life, she has been praying for the redemption of Jerusalem. The redemption of Jerusalem. So what marks Simeon and Anna is that both of these people were yearning and longing for the coming of the Messiah. Simeon waiting for the consolation of Israel and Anna yearning for the redemption of Jerusalem. And all their waiting their longing and their hope has been fulfilled in the baby Jesus that they now see who has come to save the world. So friends, what about us? Simeon says, Lord, you, you can call me back. You can dismiss your servant in peace because you have fulfilled your promise. I have seen your salvation. I have seen your salvation. 
But I don't think he saw what we saw. He has never seen any of the wonders and miracles Jesus performed, but we did. He has never heard the teachings and words of wisdom and authority and love of Jesus, but we have. He has never seen the blind see and the lame walk and the lepers cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead raised. But we have. He has never seen Jesus breaking bread and pouring wine. But we have. He has never seen Jesus die on the cross for our sins. But we have. He has never seen Jesus risen from the dead and proclaimed victory over sin and death, but we have. How much more can we say to God? God, you may dismiss your servant, for I have fully and completely seen your salvation in Jesus Christ, the Savior. So people of God, today, as we are still filled with the good news of Christmas and full of gratitude for the goodness and faithfulness of God that he has kept us safe in this past year. As much as it has been a difficult year, uh, just like Simeon and Anna and Mary's lives have been. But we can say, with Simeon, Lord, sovereign Lord, I'm yours. Take my life and let it be. For my eyes have seen your salvation through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.